Greetings and blessings from the south suburbs of Chicago. And welcome to the Calvary Baptist Church of Glenwood, where the lost can be found, where the dying can receive life, and where the saints can be encouraged. The Church of Love, welcome to the Church of Love. Church of love. Welcome to the Church of Love. May all of God's people say amen. amen. And amen. May the people of God say amen for our committed and marvelous music ministry. Again, I say good morning to all. I just wanted to take an opportunity to thank all of our members and especially all of our leaders yesterday as we had um, a marvelous opportunity to fellowship and to begin to engage in strategic planning for ministry in the coming year. And so I just want to take an opportunity to thank again each and every ministry leader um, who was a part of yesterday's call and those who have already begun the work of contacting members of your respective ministries. And I also, again, just would like for the church to recognize the diligent work of the men's ministry led by none other than Deacon William Townsend. The men's ministry every single week has been assisting in the distribution of food um, for families, for those who are in need, and they've done this every single week. So may the people of God say amen for our men's ministry. Likewise, we thank the Honorable Ron Gardner, the mayor of the village of Glenwood, for the incredible work that he's doing. Um, yesterday, um, he um, led Glenwood Bible Church in distributing 200 turkeys. Our own brother Larry Williams was a part of that effort. So again, we thank God for the work being done here in the village. And likewise, Mayor Gardner also sent me a letter just commending the work that we're doing here at Calvary. Um, likewise, tomorrow, morning at 9 30 a.m tomorrow morning at 9 30 a.m we will be holding a food giveaway here at calvary baptist church of glenwood for anyone who is in need as the thanksgiving season is soon approaching this week if you are in need of non-perishable items we will begin distributing food items at 9 30 a.m here at the church so whether you or if anyone that you know may be in need of such things we're going to be here um, early at 9 30 a.m distributing um, those um, supplies and that food for anyone who may be in need again we thank god for our diaconate for our trustees for our members for our missions ministry again for the work that they're doing in planning to continue to be of service to the greater community um, just a uh, a quick announcement concerning December 31st, um, of course, which is New Year's Eve. Um, we are going to be having a Zoom watch night service beginning at 11.30 p.m. on December 31st. So on New Year's Eve at 11.30, we will be having a watch night service on Zoom. It's going to be a very simple service. We'll simply begin with prayer leading into testimonies. Um, and after those testimonies, there will be a short word of encouragement and just asking and invoking the power of the Lord on our behalf as we enter the new year. So that will be December 31st at 11.30 p.m. Um, next Sunday, um, I will not be proclaiming, but we are happy to invite in our presence um, our dear brother in Christ, Pastor Eric Hampton, the senior pastor of Arrow Church in neighboring Linwood. He will be here proclaiming the word of God on Sunday. So we're so thankful. May the people of God say amen. Um, we fellowshiped with Arrow Church earlier this year during pop-up prayer, and so we're so happy to continue that fellowship, and that will be a fellowship that we continue to foster and grow and cultivate over the coming weeks and months. Um, also, um, just as a final note, I wanted to um, thank a particular um, brother and sister in Christ. Um, I'm not much of a singer, but for the little bit of a tune that I can carry, I owe a great debt to Sister Eleanor Harris, 
um, who was my uh, choir director, the music of ministry at the historic First African Baptist Church in Goldsboro, North Carolina, along with her daughter, Sister Valerie Harris, and even before that, Sister Ernestine Wooten was my choir director in the Sunshine Choir. So I began in the church very early, VBS, um, BYPU, Sunshine Choir, so I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a missionary church baby. Came up in the association, came up in the church, and um, Sister Valerie Harris sent um, a wonderful, encouraging note, as well as also actually um, having sent support to the church, along with Deacon Richard Coley. So we just want to thank God for our brothers and sisters all across the nation who not only are watching us through live stream, through Bible study, but also who are supporting us. Um, we have brothers and sisters from California to North Carolina to San Antonio, Texas, Corpus Christi, Dallas, Texas, Las Vegas, Nevada, um, South Bend, Michigan, um, Newark, New Jersey. I'm just naming off the top of my head West Baltimore, East Baltimore, all of Baltimore City, Largo, Maryland, um, Annapolis, Maryland, Atlanta, Georgia, Cobb County, Gwinnett County, Mississippi, Alabama, Louisiana, Arkansas, the Philippines, the Bahamas, the Kingdom of Thailand, um, both um, in the northern provinces of the Kingdom of Thailand and um, the city of Bangkok. Throughout the world, Ontario, Kitchener, Canada, Halifax, Nova Scotia, I'm just naming a few places. Um, certainly, we thank God for all of our brothers and sisters throughout the world who are watching us, who are supporting us. Um, Memphis, Tennessee, didn't want to forget about Memphis and Chattanooga, Oklahoma City as well. Um, of course, all of our men and women in uniform who watch us from Fort Sill to Fort Bragg to Camp Lejeune to Cherry Point to Seymour Johnson to Fort Lee to Fort Benning. Um, we thank God for you and for your service and for your families. We pray that the Holy Spirit continue to strengthen and protect your families as you serve. Um, so again, let us as the people of God continue to carry out the Great Commission. And Jesus commanded us to go into all the world and to preach the gospel, to go into all the world and to preach the gospel, making disciples of all nations, which we know in Greek is the word ethne, which means ethnicities. So for all of our brothers and sisters, be they black, white, brown, red, yellow, purple, magenta, and every shade in between, we thank God for you. And at this time, we just want to journey for a moment to the 34th chapter of Deuteronomy, uh, verses 1 through 12. Deuteronomy chapter 34, verses 1 through 12. I shall be reading from the New Revised Standard Version of God's Holy Word. Deuteronomy chapter 34, beginning with verse 1, reads, Then Moses went up from the plains of Moab to Mount Nebo, to the top of Pisgah, which is opposite Jericho. And the Lord showed him the whole land, Gilead, as far as Dan, all Naphtali, the land of Ephraim and Manasseh, all the land of Judah, as far as the western sea. The Negev, the south land and the plain, that is the valley of Jericho, the city of palm trees, as far as Zoar. The Lord said to him, this is the land which I swore to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob, saying, I will give it to your descendants. I have let you see it with your eyes, but you shall not cross over there. Then Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in the land of Moab at the Lord's command. He was buried in a valley in the land of Moab opposite Beth Peor, but no one knows his burial place to this day. Moses was 120 years old when he died. His sight was unimpaired and his vigor had not abated. The Israelites wept for Moses in the plains of Moab 30 days. Then the period of mourning for Moses was ended. Joshua Son of Nun was full of the spirit of wisdom because Moses had laid his hands on him and the Israelites obeyed him, doing as the Lord had commanded Moses. Never since has there arisen a prophet in Israel like Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face. He was unequaled for all the signs and wonders that the Lord sent him to perform in the land of Egypt against Pharaoh and all his servants in his entire land and for all the mighty deeds and all the terrifying displays of power that Moses performed in the sight of all Israel. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. I want to proclaim from the title, Moses has left the building. Moses has left the building. 
It is the eulogy of Moses that is found here in this final chapter of Deuteronomy. It is the final book of the Torah, the five books of the law, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. And in verses 8 through 12 especially, uh, we find what we call in my calling and profession the eulogia or the eulogy which means flattering and complimentary words spoken in honor of someone's life. In the verses leading up to the eulogy of Moses, Moses is shown the promised land that he will not cross the Jordan River to inhabit. But from the summit, adjacent to both Mounts Pisgah and Nebo, he is given a preview of the land that was promised to Avraham. Yisak and Yaakov, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Earlier in his position as prophet and military leader, Moses had killed two kings en route to this very point. He had taken the life of King Sihon and King Og, who occupied territory that was crucial to the conquest of Canaan that would be carried out later by Joshua and a new generation of Israelites. And after Moses had killed these two kings and deposed them by way of taking their lives in the third chapter of Deuteronomy, Moses stood before the people to make clear to the people what the Lord had expressed to him. The Bible records Moses saying to the people, I charged Joshua as well at that time, saying, Your own eyes have seen everything that the Lord has done to these two kings. So the Lord will do to all the kingdoms into which you are about to cross. Referencing the fact that Joshua would take the life of over three dozen kings, 31 kings, in fact, as most translations read. Do not fear them, as Moses was speaking to the people, as the Lord spoke to them through Moses, saying, Do not fear them, for it is the Lord your God who fights for you. At that time, I also entreated the Lord, saying, O Lord God, you have only begun to show your servant your greatness and your might. What God in heaven or, or on earth can perform deeds and mighty acts like yours? Moses then pleads to the Lord. He offers a plea, wanting to go into the promised land. He says to the Lord, let me cross over to see the good land beyond the Jordan, that good hill country, that Lebanon. And the response from the Lord is one that harkens back to the impiety that Moses had displayed in the 20th chapter of Numbers. The Bible says, but the Lord was angry with me on your account and would not heed me. Moses speaking to the Israelites says, the Lord was angry with me on your account and would not heed me. The Lord said to me, enough from you. Never speak to me again of this matter. Go up to the top of Mount Pisgah and look around you to the west, the north, the south, and the east. Look well, for you shall not cross over this Jordan. But charge Joshua and encourage and strengthen him, because it is he who shall cross over at the head of his people. And he shall secure possession of the land that you will see. So we remained in the valley opposite Beth Peor, Moses told the people. Moses was punished. We all recall the story from Numbers chapter 20. The Lord simply instructed Moses to speak to a rock that the rock would produce water in order to hydrate the people who were thirsty. Out of anger, Moses struck the rock and in part seemed to have even taken credit for this wonder and this sign. And as punishment, he would see the land, but he would not cross over. It is in this final chapter of Deuteronomy that Moses receives a preview and a foretaste of what another generation of Israelites would enjoy. The Bible says that Moses went up from the plains of Moab to Mount Nebo to the top of Pisgah, which is opposite Jericho, and the Lord showed him the whole land from Gilead to Dan, all Naphtali, the land of Ephraim and Manasseh. So he's seeing all the way into the north, as far as what would be called Galilee. All the land of Judah, as far as the Western Sea, the Negev, all the way to Southwest Judah, all the way to the Mediterranean Sea, and the plain that is the Valley of Jericho, the city of palm trees, as far as Zoar, he can see as far as what is called the Transjordan, the Jordan Valley. And the Bible says the Lord said to him, this is the land I swore to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, saying, I will give it to your descendants. 
I have let you see it with your eyes, but you shall not cross over. Then verse 5 tells us simply, then Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in the land of Moab at the Lord's command. Moses left the people. He died having completed what he had to do. He saw what would happen next, but it was a necessity that he not go on any further. His purpose over the past four decades had been served. One of the most popular phrases in modern usage right now, and it has been used since 1956 in reference to Elvis presently completing a performance, is Elvis has left the building. But the origin of this phrase dates back to November 1956 in Toledo, Ohio. Elvis had finished singing, and he was not the headliner of this particular show. He had performed in the middle of the show. This was at the beginning of his career. And as he was leaving the stage to go on to another performance, there were a number of feverish, excited teenage girls who began to chase Elvis. Elvis began to run, and as they set chase, they caught up to him. Elvis struggled to get away in order to get to his vehicle to go to the next performance. And there was one girl who was not having it. She took the case of a bass guitar and hit Elvis in both kneecaps, causing him to fall, and then jumped on top of him. In other words, to say, you're going to stay here and sing another song. You're not going anywhere. Meanwhile, in the auditorium, the people were shouting, encore, encore, encore. The people did not want Elvis to leave. And finally, police officers were needed in order to separate all of the women from Elvis. And Elvis finally was taken to his vehicle. But this was still not enough. The people swarmed around the auditorium looking for Elvis. And so finally, his PR director and his press agent had to take the microphone and stand on the auditorium and calm the people down and say, I don't know why all of you are still looking for him. He's gone. Elvis has left the building. And from that point forward, that became kind of a catchphrase, not only in reference to Elvis, but in reference to a lot of things. Anytime someone leaves the building, in order to make it very clear that someone who was here is now gone, that there would be no encore, but the person is gone. And we expect encores from time to time. When we enjoy something, we want a little bit more. People will swarm and hope that there's a little bit more. One more song, one more word, one more appearance. People demand an, on, an encore. And the Israelites, needless to say, had been with Moses for 40 years. Through the ups, the downs, the peaks, the valleys, and everything in between, they had become accustomed to Moses. They would have wanted an encore if they had any inkling that he was still alive. There was no way that Moses could still be alive and Joshua would take over because the people would still look to Moses. Moses had to leave. When Moses completed his work, the people of Israel certainly would have been looking for another Moses. But they had to understand Joshua was not Moses. Joshua would be different. Joshua would be who they needed for their time. And so the Bible says Moses was buried in a valley in the land of Moab, opposite Beth Peor, but no one knows his burial place to this day. God had to separate Moses from the people to such an extent that they could not even visit his grave and fear that some people will latch on to a corpse before they will latch on to the future. Moses was 120 years old when he died, the Bible says, his sight unimpaired, his vigor had not abated, his steps had not slowed down, his eyes had not dimmed. It was a necessity that he be gone. The elder brother of Moses, even, Aaron, who was 123 years of age, died that same year, months before Moses. One generation had to leave completely before another generation could finish the work. And not only that, Moses made it a point to take Aaron's clothing, to take his robe and give it to Aaron's son, Eliezer. Yes, both Moses and Aaron both had sons named Eliezer, spelled in different ways. This was all a part of the process of transition. Unlike maybe a certain 45th president of the United States, 
The leaders of ancient Israel understood transitions. They understood that when one person's time was done, it was time for one person to be seated so that someone else could begin to lead. So the Bible says the Israelites wept for Moses in the plains of Moab 30 days. Then the period of mourning for Moses was ended. Likewise, they mourned for Aaron 30 days. They understood there was a time to mourn and a time to look back at what had been done. Then a time to look forward at what must be done. After the modern equivalent of a month, after 30 days. The Bible says Joshua, son of Nun, was full of the spirit of wisdom because Moses had laid his hands upon him and the Israelites obeyed him, doing as the Lord commanded Moses. The Israelites who rebelled against Moses often, kicking and screaming, fighting against Moses often, even after being delivered from Egypt, even saying Moses has brought us here to die. At least in Egypt we had food. We should go back to Egypt even after they were fed with manna and quail and given water even from a rock, even after they defeated not one king but two kings and constant rebellions such as the rebellion of Korah would keep occurring after all of that time under the time of Joshua and during his leadership not once would the people consider rebelling against Joshua as they did Moses yes they would have their issues with Joshua as people have their issues with all leaders but Moses had to carry the burden of constant rebellions constant fighting constant uprising constant mutinies that Joshua would not have to endure the Bible says the people obeyed because they understood the transition of power had taken place. And the Bible says, never since has there ever, ever arisen a prophet in Israel like Moses. There's only one other place in the Bible this type of phraseology is used in reference to King Josiah. That there had never arisen since then a king like Josiah. That even unlike David, Josiah never engaged in the type of impiety and impropriety that David did with the wife of Uriah. Josiah never did that. The Bible says he never turned to the left or to the right, but that he always maintained a straight path, walking in the ways of the Lord. Only Moses and Josiah had this distinction, that no one else was like them. No one else was like Moses. So the people knew not to look for another Moses, that there would never be another one. And the Bible says Moses was unequaled for all the signs and wonders that the Lord sent him to perform in, a, in the land of Egypt against Pharaoh and all of his servants and his entire land. The first commandment is a reference to all that happened during the time of Moses. The first commandment, I am the Lord your God who delivered you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. You shall have no other gods before me who delivered you. The Lord delivered them by way of Moses. And finally, the Torah concludes by saying, and all the mighty deeds and all the terrifying displays of power that Moses performed in the sight of Israel. This concludes the story of Moses. Moses had died. Moses, who interceded in their rebellions that even when the Lord wanted to kill the entire encampment, of the Israelites for their rebellious nature. Moses prayed for them and interceded. Even whenever the Lord would send poisonous snakes, Moses interceded that a flaming statue of a bronze serpent could be looked to, that the people would be healed. Moses interceded. Even when the people rebelled against him and wanted to kill him, he prayed for them. He interceded. And now he had died. He was gone. Hence, everything now in this last chapter hinges upon verse 9. Joshua, son of Nun, full of the spirit of wisdom, because Moses had laid his hands on him, and the Israelites obeyed him, doing as the Lord had commanded Moses. Meaning Moses had given Joshua the best of all that he had, combined with the Lord having given Joshua something that no one else had. Meaning the Lord was improving, upgrading, and transitioning, and preparing the people for the next stage of work. There was no need for the people to look for Moses now. Moses had done what he was supposed to do. And not only that, even to this day, even in 2021, we don't know where Moses is buried. The only person who ever came close to the proximity of his burial would be the prophet Elijah. Before the prophet Elijah was taken up into heaven on a chariot of fire, he chose an area 
that would be visible from the summit of Mount Nebo, adjacent to the city of Jericho, close to Mount Pisgah. This would have been the general area in which the prophet Moses would have been buried. Interesting, but not coincidental, that Elijah would choose this area in which he would give a double portion of his spirit and transition his leadership to the prophet Elisha. This was done very purposefully. You see, Moses died that someone else could lead. Elijah was carried off to heaven that someone else could lead. This had to happen in this way. And as Joshua would lead the Israelites forward to the land of Canaan after the death of Moses, in the same way Elisha would do twice all that Elijah had done. While Elijah performed seven wonders, Elisha would perform 14. The only way this happens is when Moses leaves the building, when Elijah leaves the building. This is a part of God compartmentalizing, organizing, and carrying out a multi-dimensional, multi-part plan, meaning that God often has people of different skill sets to work from different directions towards the same end at the same time using different methodologies. Meaning Moses did things one way, but Joshua was not supposed to do things the way that Moses did them, just as Elisha was not to do things the way that Elijah did them. But both of them did everything they did according to the command of the Lord, for the same purpose. Sometimes we might see someone who's called wondering why do they do things that way when I do things this way. You do what the Lord commands you to do and you trust that that person is doing what the Lord commanded them to do understanding God already knows the end result of everything that we're all doing. God knows what he's doing so as long as we're faithful to our calling, to our steps, to our ordinances, to our statutes, as long as we are living and working and praying and striving according to what God has called us to do then God will see to it that everything that is supposed to happen will happen. I've been stressing to every member of Calvary ever since Wednesday to read one psalm a day until you read all 150 psalms. Read it in the morning, read it at night, which means this morning you should have read Psalm 5. You will notice when you read these psalms, especially Psalm 6, which deals with the healing of illnesses. Every one of these psalms speaks to what we're going through right now. Not reading the Bible when you wake up in the morning is like not taking a bath before you leave the house. And the soul gets dirtier faster than the human body. You can tell when someone hasn't been reading their Bible and praying because the soul reeks of demonic things. There are certain things that cannot come out of the mouth of a Christian if you pray when you wake up in the morning. There are certain things that cannot dwell and take root inside of you if you stay in your word every morning and every night. And the Bible does not make a recommendation about this. It doesn't make a suggestion. It's a commandment that you will recite these words with your rising up and your lying down. Every morning when Jesus woke up, he recited Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 9. Every night before he went to sleep during his earthly ministry, during the entirety of his life, he recited Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 9 because the Bible commands us to recite that every morning and every night. And teach these words to your children. It's not called the great recommendation. It's not called the great idea. It's not called the great suggestion. It's called the great commandment. The Lord commands this and you will see that your days will be different. You will see that things that you think you're going to be afraid of, you will not be afraid of because you've got something in you, on you, and all around you that protects you from the moment that you walk outside of your door. You're going to notice you've got a different pep in your step, a different clarity in your thoughts, a different confidence and strength in your words because it's not your words. It's those psalms. It's those commandments. It's those scriptures. It's the word of God speaking through you, giving you strength over your circumstances. That is what the Lord requires of us. He doesn't recommend it. He requires it. When I pray, I can hear the Lord saying to me, when did I ever recommend anything? When did I ever suggest anything? Jerry, I command you to do things. I guarantee you, if you pray, you will hear the Lord commanding you to do one thing or the other. And you will have no fear over that which you do. You will have no fear whenever you embark upon whatever you have to face. In fact, you will be so filled with the spirit, your obstacles will be afraid of you. You will not fear your obstacles. Both Moses and Elijah understood this that they had done what the Lord commanded them and then they trained and laid their hands upon someone who would then do the same. In the same way, we are the beneficiaries of someone who went on before us. The Lord often sends his workers 
in different directions to do different things for the same purpose. Many people do not know, but I've often talked about the fact Michael Jordan's favorite number is 45. That's why he wore 45 when he came back out of retirement. He always liked 45, but his older brother always wore 45. When his brother played basketball at E.A. Laney, his brother wore 45. So when Michael Jordan played baseball in high school, he wore 45. Ultimately, because his brother wore 45, he wore 23, which, if you round it off, is half of 45. And so Mike Krzyzewski of some university, I think it's called Duke, that Mike Krzyzewski promised Michael Jordan, if you come to Duke, you can wear 45. Most people do not know Michael Jordan committed to Duke University when he was at E.A. Laney. But of course, happily and proudly, if you ever visit the Hall of Fame for the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, you will see there is a framed letter written from Mike Krzyzewski and addressed to then Mike Jordan, expressing his regret that Michael Jordan decommitted from Duke and then committed to UNC. You may ask why. Well, Dean Smith did not stop trying to recruit Michael Jordan, even after Michael Jordan committed to Duke. His assistants were saying, why are we still trying to recruit him? He's already committed. And Coach Smith, in his great wisdom, said he committed. He's not registered yet. He can always decommit. So they kept recruiting him. Until one day, Coach Smith sat down with Sister Dolores Jordan and said, you know, I admire Michael and his family. And he called him Michael. Most people called him Mike at that time. Coach Smith had a point of always respecting players. If someone was named Charles, he didn't call him Charlie. He would call him Charles. If someone's name was Michael, he didn't call him Mike. He called him Michael. He said, Michael reminds me so much of myself. And he said to Sister Jordan, he said, you know, if you don't mind, I always take freshmen to church with me. He said, I realize that you're Methodist, and I can understand you wanting your son to go to a Methodist university. And I'm just a Baptist, but humbly, if it's all right, I always take the freshmen to church with me on Sunday. Now, you know and I know, if you ever want to get on mama's good side, all you got to do is talking about going to church every Sunday. And once she heard that, she informed her son, you will be going to the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. But then Michael Jordan said to Coach Smith, he said, but coach, I can't wear 45. And he said, and from my understanding, you focus on academics first, then basketball. Well, I'm not trying to hear that. I want to focus on basketball, then academics. And Coach Smith said to him, Michael, I'm interested in you becoming a good person, then a good basketball player. And as for the number 23, I wore 23 when I was in high school. I made it a good number. You can make it a great number. And the rest became history from there. And on that same coaching staff of those who recruited him would later – come Coach Roy Williams, who actually, most people forget, has won more Final Fours than Dean Smith. Dean Smith then was a Moses setting up for following generations. Because the beautiful thing is, when you now look at the uniforms of the University of North Carolina, you will see the jump man on the uniform. To think, Coach Smith was once speaking to a high school senior whose silhouette is now on the uniform of the baseball team, basketball team, football team, lacrosse team, and soccer team of the university that he attended. See, when God calls us to do something, there's a point in time that we serve a purpose. And then once we're done, we're setting things up for someone to do something greater than us. We should rejoice when the next generation outdoes us. That is the purpose of the next generation. We should be happy when our children outperform us. We should want for there to be more ushers, more deacons, I can't wait for more pastors to out-teach me, out-preach me, out-lead me. I'm doing all that I can just trying to hold things down until the next generation gets here to do things that I never would be able to do. That's why God puts us here, to serve a purpose for a time. Then we leave the building. But if we never leave the building, then the next generation can never occupy the building to do what God has called them to do. You see, certain occupants cannot be 
in the same place at the same time. There comes a point in time for certain people to do one thing. Then they must leave the building so someone else can occupy the building and then move forward with the next step of God's plan. You see, God will not allow certain things to happen until certain people leave the building. They were not going to cross the Jordan until Moses left the building. Elisha could not start his career as a prophetic voice in Israel until Elijah left the building. There's a certain point in time in which all of us must grow our olives and tomatoes and take a seat in the shade, understanding God has already begun training the next generation and our replacement. It is a good thing when you can sit down and look at the Joshua's and look at the Elisha's and look at the next generation. Do that which we did even better than the way we did it because we must remember that we are also somebody else's Joshua because somebody else was our Moses. And in terms of the building being occupied, most people don't know why Hilton hotels are so famous. Most people don't know why Hilton hotels are so popular, why they are a multinational conglomerate. It happened because Conrad Hilton, during the Great Depression, lost all of his hotels except one. Every other hotel chain during the Great Depression went bankrupt. No one had money to pay their mortgage. They certainly didn't have money to stay in a hotel. But Conrad Hilton held on to one hotel. And he went to a bank and he begged, put up his house and everything that he owned to get a loan for $40,000. In 1941, when the United States entered the Second World War, there was no one to visit the hotel. And people were saying to him, why don't you let this building go? All you're going to do is lose everything that you have. Nobody's coming back to the building. And he said, those who left won't be back. But sooner or later, some more people will be on the way. 1942 goes by. And they say, why don't you give it up? Nobody's coming. He said, there's more on the way. 1943, 44 goes by. And people say, I can't believe you're still dusting and cleaning and maintaining this building. Nobody is going to stay at a hotel. No one has any money. No one is worried or thinking about staying in a hotel. But then by September 1945, once all hostilities had ceased throughout the world, and GIs came home, and they had their checks, and they were looking for some places to go and have a good time and, and to be able to visit and take their families. There were no hotels anywhere that anybody could find. But it just so happened that there was one hotel left. It just so happened that there was just one building left for anyone who was looking for a building, that there was just one that was left. So all of the GIs and all of their families and anybody who had anything as a result of factory work and the economy turning around with the nation leaving and finally escaping the difficulties of the Great Depression, as they looked around looking for a hotel, there was only one, one Hilton Hotel which then became two and three and ten hotels, then hundreds, then thousands, because the demand was so great. But what if Conrad Hilton had given up in 42 and 43 and 44 when it looked difficult? What if he had lost heart and said, nobody's coming, so I'm shutting down? But instead, he knew even if those who left don't come back, there's going to be some more on the way. Beloved, I know that 2019 was a whole lot easier than 2020. 2020 has been a rough year, and I know that we all miss being here in the building, but don't you worry about not being in the building in 2020. 2021 is coming, and there are a lot of us who are coming back, and even for those who may not come back, Chicago is a big city with three million people. There'll be more on the way. There'll be so many people in here, we'll have to get sledgehammers and knock down every wall and build new pews in order to have to build a second story to make room for them. There will be more on the way. There are 10.2 million people in Cook County. There'll be more on the way. Indiana is just a couple of miles across the border. There'll be more on the way. Midway and O'Hare are open. People can fly in. There'll be more on the way. We'll be back in the building. That time will come and there will be an encore on that day. There's going to be an encore of goodness, an encore of smiles, an encore of laughter, an encore of singing, an encore of joy, an encore of praise, an encore core of togetherness yes it's true that Moses died yes it's true that Elijah went up to heaven 
But you know when you read this Bible, you will find out that's not the last time you see Moses. Because if you look over in the New Testament, you find in the 17th chapter of Matthew that Moses and Elijah had an encore. They met up with the Savior one day, and the Savior put in a personal request for an encore performance. So Moses and Elijah went up on the Mount of Transfiguration and had a talk with Jesus in front of Peter, James, and John. And on that day, there was an encore. I assure you, our God is a God of encores. There's going to be an encore for the people an encore of healing an encore of anointing an encore of salvation an encore of strength an encore of power an encore of wonderfulness an encore of protection an encore of guidance an encore and your needs will be met an encore he will provide for your family an encore he will rebuild your brokenness an encore he will remove your fears an encore he will clear a path an encore he will make away an encore he will give you strength an encore he will give you shelter an encore he will watch over you an encore he will come for you an encore he will uplift you an encore he will take care of you an encore he will love you an encore he will inspire you an encore he will encourage you an encore we will go forward with hope with joy with confidence may all of God's people say amen